Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be in Marseille, well, virtually, but still. Uh, uh, thank, uh, thank you uh, very much for also for the organizers to, um, to, 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 to make this happen. Um, so I will report on some joint work with Martin Widmer uh, about uh, Bertini and Northcott. So that's the title. Um, let me, before starting math, let me just mention that um, I, we, the first time we discussed this with Martin was actually in Graz. I visited Graz in 2016. Uh, he invited me uh, to give a talk and to stay there for a few days. And then, uh, so we, we met also with Robert Tichy there. So I was also pretty happy to, uh, to now report on what has been done so far, uh, thanks to that first invitation. Okay, so Bertini and Northcott, I will divide the talk into uh, three. So I will start with some generalities. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about some height functions, um, uh, define what is the Northcott number, what we call the Northcott number, and explain what Bertini theorem we obtain. Uh, so I will, I will be, uh, I, I will explain a little bit of, of the general scope. Uh, I won't go too much into the proofs, of course, but you're very welcome to ask either now or, or later. Um, and uh, so then the second part will be an application to the first part, an application of the first part to the case of abelian varieties. So the first part will be a rather general for projective varieties. And then I will uh, specialize to abelian varieties. And I'm going to describe what I call the APJ machine. So it's a, some kind of strategic theorem that aims at reducing uh, proof to the case of Jacobian, to the subcase of Jacobian varieties. So that's the second part. And the third part, we're going to learn from the machine. So we can do some we're going to describe some applications of uh, of this theorem. So uh, we're going to do a bit of machine learning in a way, if you want even though, uh, of course, it has uh, not so much to do with machine learning, but still a little play on word doesn't harm, right? So, okay, so that's the plan. Let me start. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, pick a point in a projective space. It's a point that has uh, coordinates over a number field. And so um, what we want is to measure the size of that point. So. What, uh, how do, to do that in general, what you do is you select a valuation, probably the Archimedean one, and then you do a little bit of, of analysis just to understand how big the point is. So you can also do that over the piadic fields. And then in height theory, was, what we do is we just collect everything uh, with respect to all the absolute values, uh, non-trivial, so Archimedean and non-Archimedean. So that's this MK that you can see here. It's just a set of uh, unequiv unequivalent non-trivial absolute values. So I'm just taking log max of all the coordinates and I have the height of X. So of course, a rather classical object in number theory. Um, in particular, if um, I have a number, an algebraic number now, I can see that number as an element in P1, just by saying the first coordinate will be one, and then this is my alpha. And then you just apply the formula I described here and you get the height of alpha. So we know how to measure the size of an um, algebraic number. And a, an example that is classical that will help us also a little bit later is uh, roots of unity, as we've seen in the previous talk. So then the root of unity has height zero. Uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's clear from the, formula, from the explicit formula because, uh, because, of course, all the absolute values uh, will be one. So then log of one will be zero, and we just sum a bunch of zeros. So, um, okay, so that's this uh, height. This is the height of a point. I will also be interested in uh, defining the height of a variety, um, but I will do that a bit later. So now I can define the Northcott number. So what is the Northcott number? Let me pick a set of algebraic numbers. Uh, it's, uh, it's an infinite set. It's more interesting what it is. And I will need infinite sets of algebraic numbers a bit later to formulate the first theorem. So uh, for any real number, I'm going to cut that set at height t. So that's this li little s with little t here. So now I have a, a set of numbers in s. So these are all algebraic numbers. I can take the height, the veil height that I just defined previously. And I want the height to be bounded by this level t. 
So the Northcott number of the set S is defined to be uh, the infimum of all the non-negative T's such that this ST is infinite. So, so what does it mean? It means that if I have an M of S that is finite, uh, it's possible for me in the set S to find a lot of numbers with, uh, with bounded height. So that's basically what it means, right? So uh, a lot means infinity, <laughs> really a lot. So, so this will be very important for us for the Bertini statement. I give you two examples to illustrate that definition. Let me pick uh, Q bar, or oh, we have all the algebraic numbers in S now. So then this M will be zero, and how come? Well, because previously I recalled that the height of an, al an uh, root of unity is zero. And we have infinitely many roots of unity in Q bar because we don't restrict the degree now. So, of course, uh, in that case, uh, T can just be zero. In fact, the infimum is attained. So that's the first example. Second example, uh, if we now we just restrict to Q, so if, if now S is the field of rational numbers, then the infimum is in fact plus infinity because we will never have infinitely many rational numbers of bounded height. That's the Northcott theorem. So, um, um, so this is why we call it the Northcott number. So that Northcott number is just basically saying, is there a way to select uh, a height somewhere such that below that height, I have infinitely many algebraic numbers. And all these algebraic numbers will be uh, used, uh, or at least the fact that I have a lot will be important in the, in the Bertini theorem. So, so keep that in mind, this Northcott number if it's finite, it will tell me that there's an option to get infinitely many uh, uh, algebraic numbers with bounded height. Good. So what do we know? We know how to take the height of a point, and we know how to define uh, uh, this Northcott number. So um, I go a bit uh, beyond that. So now I, I'm going to pick a projective variety of dimension G. So projective variety, basically, let's co consider it's just a a collection of polynomials, so the zero set of a polynomial, of a, of a, of a system of uh, polynomials in several variables. So that's my x, and this is defined over a number field k. So um, what I'm going to do now is define a height for x. So if you know the theory of Cho forms, then, so then you'll just follow that quickly. Uh, if you don't, so just imagine I'm picking a model that, uh, that is rather nice. Uh, it's using Plucker coordinates in the projective space I'm working with. Uh, but if, if, uh, if you're not an expert there, don't, don't worry. We just need a model that describes X in a rather nice way. Uh, so that's this Fx. So Fx is a polynomial in many variables that describes my variety X. So it's a model projective model for my variety. And then I will define the height of x to be the height of that polynomial. So you could, I mean, there are several ways of doing this. You could take, for instance, the maximum of the height of the coefficient defining that polynomial or, or the height of the vector or, or uh, uh, viewed as a projective point. I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's equivalent ways of doing this. So just basically the size of that polynomial of the coefficients describing my variety. So that's uh, the height of a variety. Okay, um, so a remark is that the, the height of X will, of course, depend on the chosen projective model. Yeah, good. So um, in part two, I will specialize uh, uh, on, uh, on, on the, the, the case of abelian varieties, and that, that's the aim uh, of the, 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 the aim of the corollaries as well in the end. So now I'm going to define another height that uh, we will use only for abelian varieties. Uh, and I'm doing this because it's a little bit more intrinsic. So for this one, I will give you a little bit more details, uh, uh, but we will use it only in, uh, in the second part, okay? So keep in mind now, if, if you have a projective variety, you have this height, uh, Chow form height, with respect to a model. So some polynomials are describing the variety, and then we just take the height of these polynomials. And now if the variety happens to be an abelian variety, there will be a competing theory, another theory of heights where we can uh, also talk about the size of the variety. Okay, so I will, I will just give you the definition here, give a few comments, and then I can, uh, I can give the, the theorem. So uh, faulting height, what is that? So now I have a number field. I'm going to deal with an abelian variety A of dimension G. 
OK is the ring of integers of uh, that uh, number field. And so it's, there's a little bit more algebraic geometry here. So um, we, we, will, we will study the variety as a generic fiber of what is called a scheme, neo, a neo model over spec OK. So basically, it, it gathers the information about the variety itself. So that's the, what is called the generic fiber. And then you take a look at what is happening when you reduce modulo the, the, the primes. Uh, um, of the of of uh, of okay, so you you take a look at what's happening modulo various prime ideals at the same time. So you have a big object like a family if you want. So that's uh, that's my uh, neo model, and then uh, there's a section of that. So what are we gonna define here? So we we want to study the size to have a definition of the size of the abelian variety, but we want to avoid choosing. Uh, projective model. We want to avoid equations in a way. So how do we do that? The trick is to use, you really go back to the very beginning of varieties in a way. What is the definition is really something that comes from differential forms. So um, what we do inside, instead of taking the size of co coordinates or the size of polynomials defining the variety, we take the size of a differential form. Uh, so how do you take the size of a differential form? So that's the space of my G differential forms here. Well, we uh, we basically integrate it. So um, for any uh, line bundle over spec OK, so for any such data, uh, uh, when when you have a section, then you 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 define what is called the Arakel of degree. So that's a complicated formula here. If you're not an expert, I I uh, I. Uh, I understand that, but uh, but okay. So basically, what you have to keep in mind is that there's a finite part, really something that comes from uh, the primes, where you reduce when you reduce modulo p, and then there's a part that comes from the Archimedean side, and this is precisely where we will uh, have these integrals coming in coming in the game. So m k infinity. This is just a set of uh, embeddings into the complex numbers. Um, so that's that's one definition so you have the the space of differentials on your variety this is a second definition if you have a line bundle you can take what is called an arakelov degree and now i come to the definition of the faulting height this is just a combination of the two we take the arakelov degree of the differentials but we need metrics to for the definition to make sense so how do you measure the size at the archimedean uh, 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 places and this is how you do. You just integrate your differential so so that you get a volume form so that this integral is actually well defined and it was going to give you a, a positive number. So it makes sense in the in the log that we took. So okay, it's a complicated number, but this is a real number, and that real number will uh, will measure the size of the variety uh, of the variety that we want to study, the abelian variety we want to study. So now uh, a remark. Uh, maybe that's the, the the thing you need to focus on is it does not depend on projective models. So in the, it's, a, it's a way to measure the size without having any model in a way uh, that's a bit more intrinsic. So this is the reason why we we spend a little bit of time on, on this because there is a way to actually measure the size of a polynomial without the polynomial if you want. So um, okay, so that's the abelian case. Uh, let me give you a little explanation that will also help you understand what's happening towards the end. Um, I give you here the explicit formula of the faulting height of an elliptic curve. So an elliptic curve has an easy model. Uh, and then uh, if you want to check how this faulting, faulting height behave, then you can take a look at uh, this formula. So um, basically, it's the log of the discriminant, so it has information about bad primes. You collect all the bad primes, well, a little bit more, sometimes they come with some powers, and then you take the norm of that ideal, it's something positive, and then you get the log of that thing. So that's the bad, I mean, the situation coming from the bad primes, from the, from the finite places. And then the Archimedean places, uh, it's also a log here of the, Delta, this is the discriminant form, delta of tau, the classical, uh, if I express it with the Q series, it's a Q product of one minus Q to the N to the power 24. And then this M tau to the to the six is a, 
is just a, 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 a some kind of symmetry factor if you want just to make sure that this will be invariant under the change of variables by the action of SL2Z. So uh, this tau is the period uh, of the billion uh, varieties of the elliptic curve. And so uh, if you take a look at the uh, J invariant expansion, so the J invariant as a modular function has a Q expansion. So you, you take that Q expansion, starts with one over Q plus seven, four, four, plus uh, one, nine, six, eight, eight, four Q plus, et cetera, et cetera. You take that form and then you compute its size for the our classical complex module. So you, if you compute its size, it will be very linked. So this strange symbol just means up to multiplicative factors, constant factors, which are essentially two pi or something like this. It's basically the size of m tau v. So if now you have a family of elliptic curves and this j invariant is moving, it will move, the log of the j invariant will move a little bit like m tau, which means if you take a look at this formula, basically the faulting height is max of the bad prime, the log of the discriminant, comma the height of the J invariant. So this is something that we can make, uh, of course, more precise. But basically, uh, what measures, what is really measured by the height, is uh, is uh, how bad uh, the reductions can be, and where are you in the moduli space of uh, elliptic curves. Yep. So, okay, for uh, for abelian varieties, we have this height that has a link with it seems to have a link with some bad primes and some J invariant. Now, the thing is that to link in general the height of an abelian variety with the bad primes is not that easy, in fact, and it will be the object of uh, one of the corollaries. So keep that in mind. For elliptic curves, it was rather easy if uh, we know these formulas. So let's see what happens in the in higher uh, dimension. Okay. So now we're ready to give the first theorem. Um, so Bertini type theorem, I will first state the theorem and then I will explain uh, why it's interesting and give you a little bit of background maybe on Bertini uh, uh, theorems afterwards. So, uh, so here it is. We will take a number field and we will fix a set of numbers, algebraic numbers with finite Northcott number. Let me recall, what does it mean? It is. It means if the if the Northcott number is finite, there's a way to find infinitely many algebraic numbers with a bounded height on S. In particular, S cannot be a number field. It has to be a little bit bigger. So now let X be a smooth closed variety in Pn, dimension bigger or equal to two. Uh, there exists a finite set inside this big S and a curve C. So an a uh, uh, projective variety of dimension one that is defined over K of little s. So it might be only defined over the number field, the base field, but it might also be that we need to extend the base field to have enough co coefficients to actually describe the curve C. This curve C is uh, drawn on X if you want. So there's a, there will be an immersion inside X. This curve is smooth, irreducible, and such that we have three controls. The genus of that curve is controlled by the degree of x squared plus the degree of x. So degree of x is essentially the degree of the polynomials that describe x in the projective embedding. Now the degree of c, so how complicated is c in terms of polynomials describing it, uh, it cannot be bigger, it, it, it may be chosen so that it's not more complicated than x, in fact. So the degree is controlled by the degree of x. And now the height of c, so the height in the sense of Cho forms, you remember. So basically the height of the model that we get for the curve C is controlled by the height of X plus a, a factor that depends on the dimension, the degree of X, that's, that's expected. And what do we have here? The Northcott number. So basically the size of, it, of C, of the curve C is controlled by the size of X and eventually some of the coefficients that we needed to actually compute uh, uh, that curve C. So it's rather natural, uh, uh, even though there's a lot of invariance, it's, it's a rather natural statement. It basically, it says, okay, you, you start with a variety, there is a way to build up a curve that has controlled genus, controlled degree, and controlled height, 
in a in a very explicit way. Um, so that's the that's the uh, that's the the result, the first result that we have. Um, so I will now comment a little bit on it. So first of all, what's a Bertini theorem? So maybe um, let me just explain the, the following thing. If you have a variety given by some polynomials of dimension G, then let's imagine you cut that variety with a hyperplane. So cut, what does it mean? It, you add an equation, uh, a, a hyperplane equation. So now the, the new system that you get describing the, the intersection uh, has dimension one less. So uh, the goal of a Bertini statement is to say, OK, when I do that process, uh, if I start with something smooth, am I still smooth? If I start with something irreducible, am I still irreducible? If I start with a property A, am I keeping that property A, if you want, when I do this uh, intersection? And why is that important? Well, if, if you know how to, how to control that, then you have a perfect tool to build proofs uh, by induction. So if you start to prove some, some statement, if you want to prove some statement in algebraic geometry and you have such a tool that says, oh, I start with something smooth. If I cut, then I find something that is dimension one less, still smooth, still satisfying the hypothesis I'm interested in, then in fact, you're starting to build up uh, some, some in, or there's an option of building up an induction argument. So that's very useful, in fact. So here, if you want, uh, I only mentioned that I, we can find a curve, but of course, how do you get a curve? Well, basically you cut and cut and cut until you find something of dimension one, and then you have eventually some components and there's a way to, uh, to single out the one that you like, and that's the curve that you, that you get. So in fact, in the proof of that statement that I, that I have here on the screen, I'm using several times the, some classical Bertini arguments to get to get uh, to get a curve in the end, something of dimension one in the end. Okay, so it's already built in if you want it in the proof. So first remark I, that I just said, Bertini theorems are very useful in particular for induction arguments. Okay, so now how do you prove this result? Uh, we rely on some previous works of uh, Philippon uh, Raymond for the for the height part or the fact that uh, that we can control some of the intermediate steps in the height. And then Kadore and Tamagawa, they, uh, they explained how to get uh, an explicit control on the genus. So the real, except for really writing down the proof and getting all the details correct, the real uh, 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 in new input, if you want, in this part on the Bertini statement is really the dependence in this S, the arithmetic uh, control on the coefficients that we are actually using to create this curve. Um, so now uh, that's uh, that's what I wanted to say as a general, like that was the very first part, generalities. So the goal now is to use that statement in the case of abelian varieties where uh, there's many open questions that I'm interested in uh, about essentially the model of a group, for instance. So the rational points of the abelian variety. So um, so that's the that's what I'm uh, planning to do now for the second part. All right. So abelian variety and abelian variety it's a, like an elliptic curve for those who maybe don't manipulate that every day. Uh, it's it's a it's a group variety that is uh, algebraic and that is projective. So it means you have equations, you have nice projective equations, and you also have a group structure really like uh, uh, similar to what is happening for elliptic curves, if you want. So examples of abelian varieties, you take the, your favorite elliptic curve and then use E, and then you do E cross E cross E G times, and then you get something that is already something of dimension G. Anyway, so I'm picking an abelian variety of dimension G defined over a number field in the second part, and now, if uh, if I insist that there's a principal polarization on it, so it's an additional structure that you can add uh, uh, sometimes, then we may even assume that the curve C that comes from the Bertini statement that we gave, so an abelian variety is projective, I can use the Bertini statement, it provides me with a curve C, right, that has controlled genus, controlled height, controlled degree. Now I can even assume that this curve, in fact, uh, uh, satisfies the following. So this curve has a Jacobian, so there's a way to build another abelian variety 
that knows quite a lot about the curve C itself. And then in fact, the abelian variety I start with can be seen as a sub abelian variety of the Jacobian. So you see the, the, the structure will be like, we have an abelian variety, on this abelian variety, we draw a curve. And in fact, uh, we may even choose that curve such that the abelian variety can be viewed as a sub-variety of the Jacobian. So the curve knows things in both ways in a way. I don't know, this is a bit vague, but it will maybe uh, be clearer in a moment. So now I want to consider a quantity of interest, Q of AK in my notation. What does that mean? Well, it will be something that depends on A and that depends on K, on the arithmetic of K. So it could be, for instance, let's say the rank of the model V group of A uh, uh, um, over the, the number field K, or maybe the number of torsion points. You see, it will depend on A, it will depend on K. Uh, it could be even just a dimension of A. It could be, um, I, what's the smallest uh, norm of a prime where you have super singularity? What's, there are many, many quantities of interest that depend on A and that depends on the base field. And I want to study all of them at the same time. So I, I, what basically I'm going to describe here is a machine that will help us getting some Diophantine information about Q. So pause a little bit. You have a quantity of interest. Maybe you're interested in the rank. Maybe it's the torsion. Maybe it's some special primes. Um, and you want to know what? You want to know if that quantity can be controlled by the height of the variety. So you want to know, is it possible that the rank is controlled by the height, let's say, or that the torsion is controlled by the height? So that's a very Diophantine question, because basically it says you have a variety in front of you and it has uh, some equations. And then um, um, you're interested in something about that variety and you want to know if you can guess something about the quantity in terms of the equation. Okay, so as you've noticed here, I'm using the faulting's height. So basically, I'm not using the equation. So the, the question is even deeper. It's more like you have an abelian variety, no matter what the type of equations you use to describe it, then the height will be controlling this quantity. This is basically what it means. So because I'm using the faulting's height here, it's something more intrinsic, so it should not depend on the model. So it should be something that is really, um, uh, that has a meaning in itself for the variety, if you want. So basically you want to know, is it possible to bound the quantity of interest? And then to be precise, of course, you have to say, well, there, there might be some, uh, some little error term or something, and it should not be depending on A, or at least maybe just on the dimension, this is what we want to allow. Okay, so that's the generic question. Is it possible to control the quantity? So let me list some desirable properties for that, that quantity Q uh, that, uh, that allow us to actually prove something. So E will be pick an extension of K. So we started with a number field K. Let me pick an extension of K, called it K prime. Now I would like this quantity to grow with extension, or at least, because you see there's a little c, not to decrease too, too, too much. So if, if I'm allowing a, a, um, it to decrease, it has to be with a, some, somehow a bounded amount. It has to, they have to be similar, comparable, okay? So E stands for extension. So for extension, I would like the quantity to kind of grow, or at least not to drop too much. So now P will be product. So now imagine you have a product of a billion varieties. I would like that quantity to grow with respect to uh, products. So as you can see in this formula, I, I'm, I'm uh, breaking the symmetry a little bit, but you can take max of A, B here. It doesn't matter because A cross B is B cross A. So uh, basically just the, the quantity for A cross B has to be bigger than the quantity for A. That's P for product. And then I will be another desirable property. So I would like my quantity not to move too much in an isogeny class. So an isogeny is a morphism uh, of, with finite degree, uh, uh, finite kernel. So 
So it's, it, I mean, I, I, an isomorphism is an isogeny, and then you, are, you, you may allow a little quotient of finite, uh, finite number of elements in the, in, the, in the kernel. So basically, if you look at A, you start with A and you take a look at all uh, a billion varieties that are not too far <laughs> uh, for, that, uh, for, for, for that matter, so isogenous, uh, then the, this quantity should not move too much. That's I that stands for isogeny. And then I have a last, uh, last property, and that will be the result I would like to prove. So I would like to have that uh, the height is controlling the quantity for any abelian varieties. And then you see here in J, I'm only asking it for Jacobians. So I'm, I'm so J has, as you can see, it's in blue has a little bit of a different flavor than the other ones. The other ones are like really axioms in a way, like you, you, this is really this, the, the kind of quantities that we can deal with. And then starting with J, you're starting the proof. I mean, you want to prove the inequality height of A is bigger than the quantity A comma K. And basically what the machine will, will tell us is that it suffices to do it for Jacobian. So this J has a little bit of a different, uh, different feeling for me, at least. Okay, anyway, so keep in mind, we have extension, product, isogenies, and the Jacobian case, which is a subcase of the general case. So now, here is the machine. So the theorem says, uh, we start with a number field, that's the base field, and then we take a Northcott uh, a, a set with finite Northcott number. So uh, that's the set S. And then assume that you have a quantity of interest Q and that you, that satisfies E, P, and I, and that J works. So that the inequality we want to prove is actually working for Jacobians. In that case, you get what you want, except that you, of course, will get a dependence on the set you started with. Okay, so you need to be able to compute or at least to bound from above the M of S such that uh, you have something explicit here. So what is this machine? Basically, the machi machine says you have a quantity of interest, you want to bound it from above by the height. Then you can reduce the whole proof to the case of Jacobians, which is a subcase where we have more tools in general. And uh, luckily, uh, you can prove the case of Jacobians and then you get the general result. So that's what the machine tells you. It says, if you can prove this inequality only in the subcase of Jacobians, then uh, you can actually uh, get the general, uh, the general result. Okay, so that's the machine. And now I would like uh, us to learn from the machine altogether. So let's see what we can actually prove with that reduction step that we uh, describe here. So this is my first example. Um, I'm going to consider primes of bad reduction. So now I'm defining my quantity of interest. What is of interest? What am I interested in? Well, I have my abelian variety, and I'm very interested in understanding when is, is it that when you reduce mod p, you have a, a singular uh, 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 node, set, let's say. When, when, when is it that you have bad reduction? That's important for many applications. So, 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 so it's, it's actually something that it's, it's nice to control. It's actually nice to, to be able to, to guess or to find explicitly where are these, uh, these primes. So now P is an ideal, it runs into okay, and I am focusing on semi-stable bad reduction because I, I'm allowing myself to, to, to do finite extensions of, of the base field in the proof. So, um, so that's, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a problem. So now, what, so now I'm gonna check the desirable properties just to make sure I can use the machine. So I, I start by E, and in fact, E is, is, is not completely easy. Um, e was extension, so it means that I take my quantity, so the norm of the bad primes, and I want to know what's, hap what's happening when I do extensions of fields. But as you know, if you take a norm of an ideal and you, you now start to extend the field where you take this norm, if the ideal is ramifying, then this, I mean, the quantity will not increase. <laughs> so uh, the, the extension property is now, we're now already in trouble. So the thing is we can control that by controlling the ramification of K prime. So now if you, 
if, if, if let's say you take an unramified extension, then you know it's not going to drop. This quantity is not going to drop. So, so basically, if you start with a base field K and you can find enough numbers of bounded height in an unramified extension, you're good to go. You have, uh, you have enough numbers so that you will be able to use the Bertini statement to build the curve, etc. Uh, but this is not always possible because some fields don't have enough unramified extensions. Sometimes they don't have any, any. So basically, there's a lot of arithmetic here. Uh, the, the main result that we use to ensure that it's possible to reduce to a case where you, we have enough unramified extension is a theorem of golod Shafarevich from the 60s, where you actually find a way to build a tower, in, an infinite tower, in fact, with the steps that are extensions of degree two, where you have um, unramified uh, extensions. So basically, it's possible to deal with this and to ensure that E works, but it will not be for any S. It will be for uh, an S that needs uh, that needs to be built and that needs uh, that, uh, that that needs careful treatment. Okay, but it is possible. It's part of the result. So okay, extension we get. Now. Good stuff is that uh, the others are easier. Now, product is easy because if you have a bad prime for A, of course, it will be a bad prime for A cross B. So then we have P uh, for free. And we have I for free. Uh, so I'm saying easy is not completely easy, but it relies on some existing results. So isogenous abelian varieties, they share the same bad primes. So then, uh, of course, the quantity will not, will not move in that case. So we have E with some work. P is easy, I relies on some previous works. So, um, so we're good to go. We have a quantity that, uh, that could lead to something. The thing is, the J, uh, the, is it easier for Jacobian? So basically, I'm telling you how to reduce an inequality to a subcase of Jacobian varieties. But if it's not easier for Jacobians, then you, <laughs> you just did everything for nothing. So we need to work a bit for the Jacobian case, luckily, of course. Uh, I selected that example because we know how to do something. So for J, we can use what is called the Noether arithmetic formula. So it's not an easy formula. It comes from a of geometry, but it says the following. If you have a semi-stable curve C, this faulting's height, this very intrinsic height, uh, has a closed expression, uh, closed formula that goes like this. So it's a sum of some um, um, integer, integers times log of the bad primes. So this is precisely log of the bad primes that I'm interested in. Uh, these integers are uh, bigger or equal to one uh, as soon as you have some stable bad reduction. This is precisely what I want to control. So I can just lower bound delta p by one. And then I have some other terms. So this delta sigma, this is the, what is called the delta invariant of Faltings. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a, um, analytic invariant that is rather mysterious. And then omega square is the dualizing sheaf, auto intersection of the dualizing sheaf of the curve. It's also something rather abstract. Luckily, recent work of Robert Wilms that appeared in the Infectionist Math in 2017 uh, lead to this sum, so the extra terms that we have here, being non-negative. How, how nice. So basically, what does it mean? It means we have J. You see, this is the height, faulting height that we, that we want uh, on, on, on the left side. And then this is the bad primes that we want on the right side. And we have the inequality that goes in the right direction. So we have J. If we have J because we have E for a specific S, P, easy, and I coming from previous works, then basically we have the result. The machine tells us Faulting's height is in fact controlling the bad primes. So if you want to go into the details, in fact, the S that uh, I found uh, is, is even controlled by a constant that depends only on G. So uh, there are other proofs of that uh, inequality that are rather recent. Um, and they use a different technique. So uh, they come from, uh, the first one comes from Hindry and Pacheco, they, where they proved this for function fields, abelian variety over function fields. And that was adapted by Wagner in his PhD. So there's another way to prove this inequality uh, uh, the, by using rigid uniformization. So, so it's a different 
completely different way. And then you have Robin de Jong and Farbot Chokrier, a bit recent, that uh, gave another proof uh, using Berkovich spaces. So both proofs are use rather rather heavy machinery, and uh, but but they lead to uh, to the same, uh, in fact, to slightly stronger results. I can give you some details if you want one day when we have a blackboard again. I can uh, maybe give a little bit more on this. Anyways, so this inequality now is correct, and uh, it actually leads to an interesting corollary that I'm now going to give you. Interesting corollary, and this is this upper bound on the rank. So because I have the control on the bat primes by the height, and because I know how to do descent on uh, general abelian varieties, so that's a different technique, something, something else, I can prove that the rank of A uh, is bounded above by the following expression. So take a look. So now I have some explicit constant C that depends on the dimension of A. And then I have the degree of uh, the, the base field to the cube. And then I have max of one log of the discriminant of the base field. So the, the primes that ramify in the base field. And then the faulting site of, uh, of the abelian variety. So this is unconditional. This is really something that you have uh, 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 using, combining both inequalities, one that says the rank is controlled by the bad primes, this is the descent argument I mentioned, but I didn't explain here, and then the, what I explained here is bad primes is controlled by the height, and so if you combine both, of course, you get that the rank now is controlled by the height with this explicit expression here. So that triggers the following question, is there any hope to do better I mean, we would like to know how the rank is varying, say, for elliptic curves over Q even. Uh, we don't know if it's bounded or not. And there are competing heuristics. Try to understand if it's bounded or not, and if it's bounded by what, and to understand a little bit more about families of these elliptic curves or of these abelian varieties. So now, um, what, what can we expect using these techniques of Diophantine inequalities. So there's one thing that I would like to know, is it possible to get rid at least of the, the, the discriminant here? This is something that, that would be interesting to know. Um, I mean, the bound on the rank has to depend on the field, on the base field, because, uh, I mean, otherwise you get something crazy. I mean, if, if you increase the, the, the um, if you increase the base field, you get new points, and there's a way to prove that, in fact, the rank is growing indeed. So it has to depend on the field. You know you need a dependence on the field in the upper bound. But uh, do you really need the discriminant? Discriminant is a complicated invariant. Degree is a very easy invariant. So if the control could be only in terms of the degree, we would be rather astonished and happy. I would be happy, at least. So that's the question I have. Is there any hope of doing better? But now we have a machine. We can use that machine, maybe, and check what's happening. So what's happening here in this last part? Um, I'm now this fixing that the quantity of interest, the new quantity of interest, is the rank itself, not the bad primes, log of the norm of the bad primes, whatever, from before. Now it's the rank itself. So now let me check the desirable properties to see if I can use the machine. So now extension. Yes, when you increase the base field, you increase the rank. Or maybe you stay stable, but at least you don't go down. So E is easy. So now P is easy as well, because if you have an abelian variety, if you cross with another one, then you can only add, uh, you can only add in the rank. So, so the product is also easy. And now isogeny is uh, also easy because, I mean, recall an isogeny, an isogeny has a finite kernel, so you cannot kill uh, a direction. You cannot drop the rank here. So, um, so we have EP and I, so it means that we are now reducing to the case of Jacobian using the machine. So what's the case of Jacobian? So, so we have to be very careful here because if we just take the rank here and if we just take the faulting height here, some properties about, about the faulting site tell you that um, uh, this kind of inequality will not hold like that. You need a dependence on the base field extra. 
because basically the faulting site has a tendency to uh, to drop by extension until it reaches semi stability and then it's stable it stays constant so basically this inequality would be the rank is bounded by something that does not depend on k this is which is not correct so it means that in this inequality you need a constant that depends at least on uh, the degree okay fine so then what happens if we assume that then in fact we uh, we, we we reach what is called Honda's conjecture. So Honda's conjecture says the rank of an abelian variety over a number field uh, could be, would be, maybe is controlled by a constant depending on A times the degree of the base field. So this is a slightly more precise or maybe a bit stronger form of Honda's conjecture. So it's a conjectural statement that says that in fact the rank is controlled linearly in terms of the degree as soon as you fix A. And what we say here is that if uh, the constant depending on A in, 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 the, in this inequality is in fact uh, linear in the height or polynomial in the height, it will be similar, then in fact the whole proof uh, boils down to proving the Jacobian case. So, you, I mean, the machine doesn't give you that completely directly because there's this extension of field that you need to do and you need to check uh, uh, quite a few details, right? But the philosophy is really this. The philosophy says, you tinker a little bit with the engine, that's what I wrote. So the philosophy says, okay, so basically if you want to prove Honda, um, uh, you can start by Jacobians and, uh, and, and you, you, you'll get there eventually using some uh, reduction uh, some reduction step that is provided here uh, by the machine. Okay, so uh, now uh, Honda is a, is a very difficult conjecture, and uh, we don't we don't really know much more in the Jacobian case, in fact. So uh, so it's still uh, it's still something uh, we think about. But anyways, uh, we were pretty happy to see that uh, we could reduce this statement to that. Good. So um, I think I've uh, I've said what I wanted, and uh, I would like to uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, Fabian, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, there is already one question formulated. Uh, yes, so I see a question in the chat by chat Philippe Habegger. By Philippe, yes, so he is asking whether your bound can be replaced by this bound here, constant times ah. log of degree of isogeny. Yes, so, uh, uh, so the, the short answer is yes. I will now give maybe a little bit, a uh, little bit more. So here you see he's referring to uh, to this, this C. So now if I have two isogen, two abelian uh, varieties and an isogeny, uh, there's an important invariance is that the, the degree of that isogeny. So now if I allow myself here to have a, a log of the degree of the isogeny using work of Masser and Wustols we can control the degree of a minimal isogeny by a polynomial in the height. But if I take the log of the degree, then I get a multiple of the log of the height. But I'm dealing with heights here linearly. So if I get, imagine I get some uh, extra term here that is logarithmic in the height coming from errors. It won't matter in the end for the general statement. So uh, the answer is yes, Philip. I can weaken the condition uh, like that. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Is is that satisfactory, Philip? Or are there following up questions? Okay. 